welcome to the Daryl Medina Workman's Village module. Now the Workman's Village is actually very, very interesting. Um, it tells us quite a lot about things that we wouldn't know about um, if it wasn't for this village. It's actually from the New Kingdom. There are other Workman's Villages, like Round the Pyramids and stuff like that, uh, which Mark Leher is um, currently excavating and, and have also told you quite a lot about the, the life of the people and Lahoon there's a, a, a village and so forth but this one um, of the workers of the Valley of the Kings and they were called workmen in the place of beauty which is rather nice and they're 18th, 19th and 20th dynasty only um, the uh, village is quite famous for a number of things. One is the, is the first record of strike in history. Um, towards the end of the 20th dynasty, when um, the Egyptian Empire was starting to fall to pieces and um, things weren't happening as they should, the workmen here got paid in kind. So, you know, they got food and they got beer and they got clothing and so forth. And they didn't get their rations. So they um, down tools, went on strike, and um, uh, this is all recorded. Um, that didn't work, so they then went and did a sit-in down at Medinay Habu, and they did get the, their rations then, but it was actually a sign of the beginning of the end for the Egyptian Empire. Um, it, it's interesting to see the social class here, that, that they're actually quite important people. Um, we know this from the mummies that have had medical procedures. They are having very good quality medical procedures, you know, like the setting of broken legs and stuff like that. So um, these, these were quite important people and they were looked after by Pharaoh. Pharaoh wanted them to... Um, you know, feel that they were his special people, or because then they build him a better tomb. So, um, you know, a lot of people had this thing that, that they were all killed and they were slaves, and this is not true. Um, you know, you, 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 you're a pharaoh, you, you've just buried your dad, and you're thinking about your own tomb. You're not going to kill the very people that are building the best possible tombs. You hang on to them and get them to build your tomb. Um, so at the site we've got the village um, and this has been excavated. Because this is out um, in the desert area, they use stone for a lot of the building, whereas in, um, normally they only use mud brick and we haven't got a lot of evidence of village. But because there was stone used here, um, they, we've got a lot more evidence of what the village looked like. Um, they were buried here and they sort of seem to have a, a central street dividing and on the east of this street is the village and on the west is their cemetery, which is quite interesting. Um, and then at the end they've got a temple. Now the temple that's there at the moment is quite late, it's Ptolemaic, but there was probably a temple on this site um, during the whole time of the village. And then if you go even further, there is this so-called Great Pit, which is a great pit. And nobody's quite sure why it's so great, but it is really great. And they found a lot of rubbish in it and stuff like that, which has told us an enormous amount about the village. We've got, a, because they were very literate, we have a lot of writings coming from this village that were jotted down on the ancient Egyptian equivalent of a post-it note. Um, shards of pottery, which are called ostraca. So we know a lot about them. And, and there's quite a, a few good books about this um, that I've got on my shelves um, uh, about the village and about uh, the workmen and the ostraca and stuff like that. So this is the village. Um, you see it covers quite a large area. This is taken from up um, uh, on the donkey trail. Um, you see it's got a boundary wall going all the way around it because obviously Pharaoh wanted to protect these people because they are important to him. Um, and he, the, the, at this end here, just by here, there's a little guard hut area. This is the temple. 
and this is the tombs up here on the side. Well, this is actually the roof of one of the tombs here. Um, uh, the, the village was extended during its life. At the biggest, it was some 70 families. And um, if you're looking at a family size max 10, it's quite a lot of people. And they were all living on top of each other. Um, so they all knew each other's business. And, and you, you can just imagine the, the um, gossip and so forth. Because the men went away on 10-day shifts. And the women are all like, oh, you know, I've been on at him to finish that tomb. I know what's going to happen. We'll be dead and mummified and it still won't be painted. You know, you you really can. You can stand there looking down these narrow little streets and, and you can see Nark's wife poking her head out and yelling at the kids. This is uh, one of the uh, insides. And they, quite a lot of them have this structure. So uh, there's a lot of dispute about what they are used for. Some people have said it's a bed, but although Egyptians were short, this length here would seem to suggest it's a little bit too short to lie down comfortably. It has a little row of stairs going up to it. Other people have suggested it's a birthing platform. Well, speaking as a lady, I'm not sure I want to give birth on that in the middle of the front room. I think I'd like a little place, a little bit more comfortable and a little bit more private. Um, and uh, the other suggestion is that the, this was a shrine and that um, offerings were put here and there were statues of household gods and maybe a bit of ancestor worship and so forth. I, I'm personally more in favour of the, the shrine theory. I think it more, makes more sense about where it was located. Especially as um, the bed idea, knowing how Egyptians sleep now, today, um, they very often sleep on the roof when it's hot. Um, so I, I can't see this sort of being used as a bed. Now, um, the tombs um, to the west, uh, there's a lot of them, and um, during the life of the village, um, the, the, you know, it was location, 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 and the better ones are built uh, uh, on the hillside or in the cliffs, and later on in the life of the village, you, you had to settle for whatever bit of space that you could find. Now, they're topped with little pyramids, with little pyramidiums. Now, this little white bit here is a pyramidium. Um, on Pharaoh's tombs, these would quite often be gold or something like that, but obviously we're just talking white limestone here. But you see that these guys, that they know all the different styles. So um, on, in their tombs, they, they're, they're not going to go for a traditional noble's um, tomb because, you know, that, that they know that kings have pyramids on top. And they're like, oh, I see one of those myself. It doesn't have to be as big. Um, and I'm sure they swapped between each other, you know, I'll build your pyramid or I'll carve your pyramid if you paint mine and this kind of stuff. Um, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of bargaining and bartering going on like that. Um, they, they have tomb chapels up above ground and then burial chambers underneath. The tombs are an unusual uh, decorative style as well because Again, they paint Pharaoh's tombs as well as painting nobles' tombs. And when we get on to the Valley of the Kings, we will find a king with a noble's background who or rather unusually has a noble's scene in his tomb. And these are um, uh, nobles that have royal scenes in their, their tombs. They have these little pyramids. Now, the, the ones that are open at the moment are Senegem Senage and Ankerhor. Now, that, that is sometimes spelt with an I instead of an A. Um, so you can see alternative spellings of it. Um, Hashidu is an extra ticket. And um, it, it's really quite a nice little tomb. And its big advantage is that you have to climb up to get to it, so you get quite a good sort of aerial view of the, of the village. Occasionally, one of these main um, tombs is closed, and they will 
um, open another one. And um, uh, a little while ago, they closed Sengem and opened Iranessa. And um, that I went round that, and it was a really nice tomb. So don't be massively disappointed if, if one is closed and you get offered an alternative one. It can be really good. Um, and of course, you know, I'd be delighted to um, explain to you if it's a different tomb that's open, you know, what its particular things are and, and what you should look out for in there. Now, um, this is the uh, tomb of Senegem, barrel vaulted. Um, as you can see, it's very, very colourful. Um, and uh, small. <laughs> um, it's got uh, scenes of the gods, it's got Cyrus there with the green face, it's got um, the uh, owner of the tomb and his wife adoring the gods, um, it's got the, the, uh, uh, the mummy on a bed there with um, Isis and Nephthys either side as bar birds, it's got the funerary feast, um, very, very, very pretty tomb. Um, here's a close up of them. Now, do, do you notice they're wearing ramicide clothing and this is highly pleated, um, very, very ornate. And I've never quite understood this is it goes up at the back there. Now, if you've been out in Egypt, you know, it's a hot, sweaty country. And I can't see how those pleats would have stayed in at the back there. Um, unless they were boned or something like that. Um, it's very interesting about Ramesside clothing. It always puzzled me. Um, the ladies wear very diaphanous see-through stuff. And, of course, they're, they're always shown as pretty slim things. You know, um, there's, there's no woman that looks as though she's had 13 babies on the trot or anything like that. Um, they all look um, very young, and well, you, you portray yourself as you want to be as it for eternity, don't you? So, you know, you're going to go to look like a bimbo because it's much nicer to look like a bimbo for eternity. Um, here is Anubis um, doing some of the funerary rites on the mummy, um, and do you see that bed there with the little lion head? If you've been in Tutankhamun's treasure in the Cairo Museum, you will have seen three beds like that. Um, and this is the, what they would have been used for. Um, here is the, the owner and his wife with some little grandchildren sitting there under the table. And they've got four locks of youth. You know, they've got the hair in this sort of curious plait thing on the side. Um, and there's, there's the son acting as a priest, wearing a leopard skin and making offerings um, to the owners of the tomb. Now, by painting your son doing that, even if he forgets after a few years, um, because it's painted on the walls, it's still happening. So this is quite important for you. Um, now, this is the, the roof of the tomb, and you've got scenes of Raharakti in the boat, and the gods, and the owners offering to the gods. This is uh, the second tomb, and as you can see, there's lots of scenes of the funerary feast here, um, and um, the owner and his wife playing games and having incense offered to them. Um, but it's also got this very famous scene of uh, the cat. Now, that is a cat. I, yeah, apparently it's a cat. Funny is, but it's a cat attacking the bad snake for you on your behalf, um, and then you've got uh, the kefir, the um, uh, rising sun, um, with a necklace on the other side, and then um, the owner and his wife in a boat being rowed along um, along the Nile. Um, th th this is quite a, a sad scene. You can see that the face of one of the little children who's missing and if you buy postcards up at the site um, the postcards have this little boy's face on them so sadly this is gone in the last few years and you can see the fragility of the tombs and why um, that they when you go in here you know it's really hot and sweaty and it's not good 
for these paintings. They're really suffering. And that's why they've banned cameras in the Valley of the Kings, because people were spending too long in the tombs, their hot, sweaty breath, and it was damaging the tombs. So by restricting this, they spend less time in the tombs and, and we can look after them a bit longer. But, um, yeah, terribly sad to see that face as well. This is Pasha Do, the extra ticket. Um, and if you've ever stayed at my flat or intend to stay at my flat, you'll see that little scene there above my swimming pool. Um, I really like that. It's Pasha Do drinking from the river of life with this date palm um, there. And I've got a date palm in front of my house as well. So nice. um, this is uh, Kefa, the um, morning sun. The kefir beetle rolls a little ball of dung with an egg in it between its um, claws and uh, they thought that there was a big one in the sky pushing the sun along and new life came from it. Um, and, and then you've got Raharakti, falcon head sun disc. Yes, we're getting it. Um, and you've got barbers here. Um, the spirit uh, goes with different things and... Um, uh, the car, the unk, and the bar. And the bar bird goes flitting about having a jolly good time, but it needs a body to return to. Um, and this is the other wall where we've got the deceased making offerings to Osiris with a green face, green for regeneration, um, with the uh, hill, hills, you know, the Theban hills behind and these little burning sticks of incense there, and more barbers and the eyes of Horus. Um, once you've seen the tombs, you should go on to the temple. It's missed often by groups, so maybe you've been to this site before and you're like, temple? What temple? So do go along to the temple. Um, the temple is a very girl power temple. Um, because it's dedicated to Mart and Hathor and also to some interesting people Imhotep and Amenhotep, son of Harpy who were both um, uh, really good architects and administrators for the pharaohs and became sort of like saints or minor gods in their own rights. Now <clears throat> In the uh, temple, there is a number of gods depicted and goddesses. And there's one, Montu, with a female. And I spent years trying to find out who this female is. What do you know about camels and ancient Egyptians? Ah, well, we'll get on to that as well. And the Greeks and judgment. Uh, uh, the because Mark is the goddess of judgment, there's some great judgment scenes in here. Now, this is the temple, uh, it's a nice little temple, um, uh, with the backdrop of the Theban hills behind it. It's Ptolemaic and it's it's got the various Ptolemies and Cleopatras all around it. Now, camels. <laughs> Concentrate hard and believe me, I'm an Egyptologist. Do you see that bit of graffiti there? There's the legs. Okay, there's the hump. This is the only depiction of a camel that you will find in, on an ancient Egyptian tomb or temple because they didn't have them. They were introduced by the Romans. And um, this is a bit of graffiti that was put on this uh, wall by a tribe called Belmese, and the, this was about AD 60. So this is the only camel that you will find. Now, there's lots and lots of Greek graffiti here. Um, uh, I, you can just make it out. I came here with my friend Archimedes. He had a bath and I drew a triangle, signed Pythagoras. 
No, only joking. Um, it's a little blame I play, sorry. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it, to see all this graffiti up there. I, I talked about graffiti in the Ramosseum, and you can see how graffiti can tell us a, an awful lot about the kind of people that were visiting and when and so forth. We, we've got a little bit up there. Do you see, it says 1851. So obviously, people were coming to this temple. It was open, known about in 1851. Um, the first sort of tourists in ancient Egypt were the ancient Egyptians. And there is a bit of graffiti down at the Step Pyramid um, that sort of written by a New Kingdom guy saying, I came here for the Step Pyramid of Zosa. And in fact, that's the only reason we know it's Zosa's Step Pyramid, because of that bit of graffiti. Um, and then you've got Romans leaving graffiti here, we've got Greeks leaving graffiti here, and, and we've got all the European travellers as well. Don't you leave any graffiti there. Um, this is Ptolemy IV on the back wall here. Um, even though these are uh, sort of Greco-Roman um, rulers, uh, they look completely ancient Egyptian. Because this was the best way to get the people on your side was to continue on the uh, the way that Pharaoh had done for centuries and centuries and centuries, um, and, and then all the Egyptians that were your subjects will be like, oh, well, we're quite happy to have him as Pharaoh. Um, we'll, we'll go along with that. This is inside the temple, and here's another one of these uh, two-story windows. Um, there's a, a little set of stairs up there, and this is another one where the guardians may or may not let you go up that set of stairs. Uh, if you do get a chance to go up there, you get a very good view of the Ramesseum from the roof up there, which is almost directly opposite. Um, you can see just over there the column is a, a very... Uh, floral um, decorative column, very Ptolemaic column, and the walls and everything, very, very busy. And if you remember, that's a good sign that it's a Ptolemaic uh, decoration. Now, now here is um, a, a scene, uh, it's not the best photo in the world, but it, it's a bit tricky because um, uh, the, the, um, the, the width of this chapel is, is quite small. So it's very difficult to get far enough back um, to see it. But it's very unusual to see a judgment scene on a temple wall. You see loads in tombs, but very unusual to see it on a temple wall. But because this um, chap is dedicated to Ma, um, so she's shown in her most important role. So here she is, and there's her feather on top of her head. This is the scales, with Anubis and Horus helping out in the judgment. Here is your heart in a pot, and here is the feather again. And if it balances, that means that your heart hasn't spoken against you, because you've been quizzed by this lot here, 42 assessors. And there are 42 up there. And they ask you all sorts of questions. And these are very uh, Judeo-Christian kind of things. You know, did you murder? Did you steal? Did you cover? Those kind of things. There's also a fairish number about the Nile because of it, it being Egypt. Did you steal your, your neighbor's um, uh, water from the Nile? Did you move the boundary? Um, you know, these kind of things that have to do with the inundation and so forth. Now, you have to say no to everything. Uh, you can lie. You can use magic. Um, but your heart might speak against you. So you put a, a heart scarab on your body, saying, heart, please don't speak against me. Now, Thoth here records the result. And when you're in this chapel, if you look at his scribe's palette there, you can see a blob of red and a blob, blob of black ink, and he's got a slip of pen in his hand. And if you pass, you go through to Osiris, who's sitting there nicely on his throne. If you don't, you get eaten up by this critter here, um, which is not a pleasant ending. Of course, nobody ever fails in these things. Now, this 
is uh, another spot the god seen. Um, so, Pharaoh, double feathers with a lady, double crown, with a boy, moon, crescent, and full moon. Yes, Armin, Mook, and Honsi. Another falcon head with a sun disc with double feathers. Monchu. Then we have a lady. Now, it took me ages to identify this wretched lady because I don't read hieroglyphics. Uh, but I, I am a computer programmer by background, so I use a little bit of logic here. And I was like, right, this appears, this set of glyphs appears every time above the fairer, the uh, god's name. So some of them I know, like Mu is a vulture. So there's a vulture. So, um, uh, and the ones up here, there's an Isis one as well. So I reckon that these glyphs here must be the name of this goddess. So I started trying to do a bit of research and eventually I recognised and identified this lady. And it's Tynanet. Yeah, I hadn't heard of her either. And she's Monchu's consort. Um, and she's been around a long time. Um, you know, this is quite an ancient goddess. But she doesn't appear a lot. Um, but here she is at Daryl Medina. Now, here we have some nice colourful ones. Um, again, the, the, um, the features here being painted black and so forth. This is the, the regeneration and um uh the life giving force and so forth. But the ladies here are in nice pale colours with these gorgeous vulture head dresses and they've all got horns and sun discs so you have to concentrate a bit to identify who they are. And this is one glyph that I do know. It's a bird in a box and that's Hathor. So um thanks for watching. By the way uh, there's a lot of photos here that I've scanned in from the Kent Weeks guidebook because you're not allowed to take photos in the tombs and um, I've got a lot of photos in Noble's tombs from when you were allowed and some of my friends have but I didn't have any of this particular set so uh, I've been using photos from the Kent Weeks' Luxor Guidebook, which I really recommend if you want some good colour photos. He also does an enormous um, colour uh, coffee table book, which is an expansion of that guidebook. It's not cheap, but it's got some really class photos in it. And there's also a, a website, osirisnet.net, and that has a lot of um, depictions of nobles' tombs and photos again from people that have taken them in years gone by so if you want to look at some good photos of these tombs um, those would be the place that I recommend that you go to. Um, our next module is uh, the Assafif Nobus Tombs um, and I have got some photos that are mine on that one so uh, look forward to seeing you on the next module and I hope you've enjoyed Daryl Medina.